Oh my gosh, look who it is. I must be doing well. It's the president of the Council on Foreign Relations and the author of what the this 15th book that you've either authored or edited, The Bill of Obligations. Go buy it, everybody. The 10 Habits of Good Citizens. I've read it, sir. It's excellent. Great to see you. Great to see you, Pete. Good to be back. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very, very much for joining me. I'm I'm loving this book. I'm I'm very much excited to do the best interview that anybody's done for you on it and ever will. So uh, thank you for for joining me. I do have to ask you just one kind of topical question, of course, to get started. You're a pretty big deal. You've seen it all. You've worked in government and out of government and you know everybody. Do you, sir, have any classified documents at your home or offices (laughs) or in your your, uh, black helicopter? (laughs) Well, the black helicopter is a different matter. Filled with boxes of classified documents. That's all the chopper's for, is my understanding. It's what's known as a flying skiff. You know, it's, it's, it's <laughs> oh, that's right, the FS. I didn't even realize that you had codenamed it. Uh, seriously, though, I mean, your take on all of this three, you know, they're obviously different, but is is any of this surprising you that classified documents have turned up at least at Pence and, and Biden's house, much less Trump? Well, a little bit, only because one takes such care with them. On the other hand, you realize there are so many thousands of documents these people traffic in. The idea that a few might have been mixed in, probably not by then. They're not the ones packing the boxes when they leave the White House or the Senate, it's staffers. So it doesn't totally shock me. Qualitatively different than the situation with the former president, which shall we say was was knowing. The idea that there would be things that were unknowing does not totally shock me. Right, right. Well, All right. The book, The Bill of Obligations, The Ten Habits of Good Citizens, because you are who you are when people uh, see you at the, I don't know, salad bar, wherever you hang out. They say, hey, (laughs) Richard or Mr. Sir or Mr. President, tell me, what do you think are are, are the greatest threats? Who who should we be looking at? The Russians, the Chinese, the North Koreans, Al Qaeda? Are you worried about the the, the cyber threats? And you probably and apparently, according to your book, you're like, yeah, yeah, all those are things. But what I'm really worried about, most importantly, is right here at home and the deterioration of our democracy is what you, you open with. Right. Is that about do I have it about right? You have it so right that I don't think you need me for this interview. Thank you for joining me. Get the book. (laughs) <laughs> and learn how to tie the perfect tie, which is your next book. I mean, but that's that's your concern, the, the, the dem- democracy. In a way, this is your version of the of the book about and uh, the concern and, of course, your your idea for solutions. Absolutely. It's not a book I ever thought I would write, I'll be honest with you. And five or ten years ago, I wouldn't have uh, written it. But uh, like you, I think what the last few years have taught me is don't assume anything. Don't rule anything out. And the more I started looking at it, the more seriously I took the possibility that our democracy was not going to last another two and a half centuries unless we got some things fixed. History matters so much. And many people living today in America, certainly young people, much less middle aged folks like me, don't even know our own history, much less the history of the world and, and, and how democracy came to be or what it really is. So you lay out the history a bit of it and the uh, at the opening of the book, which is fascinating. I certainly learned a lot. And you basically are saying very hard to minimize. People have to get the book, but that we needed a bill of rights. They added a bill of rights. And then we can get to what you call the bill of obligations. But give me a little bit about the history that you think is, is really important and, and how we came to needing the bill of rights. Well, if, you know, the context is, is all here. The United States had just you know, fought a war of independence. And successfully, the first government, the Articles of Confederation, were totally dysfunctional. They created a central government that really wasn't a central government. So you had a constitutional convention, and the idea was to build something that could actually run a country, that had some institutions, some powers. But people got worried. They said, wow, if we build a central government that is strong enough to be functional, it's also strong enough to be repressive or tyrannical. And we just fought a war of independence against that. So the Bill of Rights were essentially part of the political bargain that in order to have what you might call Constitution 2.0, to replace the Articles with something better and stronger, you had to issue certain protections. And just to be clear, these were the protections against the federal government, not against state governments, against the federal governments on behalf of of the states and the individuals. And that was the the political bargain. It was a necessary one. It was uh, it was incomplete, but it was necessary. And 
you say the Bill of Rights made progress in protecting individuals against the federal government, but not the states. What does that lead to? What does that mean? Well, that's in part what led to the Civil War. It's in part what led to the 13th and 14th and 15th Amendments. Again, the, the focus was on protecting individuals and states against federal encroachment. And that was, shall we say, uh, necessary. But it wasn't enough because with issues of discrimination, obviously slavery, we had the Civil War. The whole idea of individual rights needed to be protected as well or guaranteed as well against encroachments from the state. And that is essentially why we fought a, a civil war. It's why we had the 13th, 14th and, and 15th Amendments. And that, that was part of the the it was a necessary evolution, if you will, of the American political system. Uh, I'm telling you, sir, I read the book. Look, it's all highlighted. Do you mind if I read a quick paragraph in this opening section, rights and their limits, and, and you can pick up? Do you mind if I read your own words, Haas? <laughs> I'll do it better the than... World, but I I'll mind do, if you read the book. I'm a, yeah, I'm a great performer. I'll do it even better than, than you, sir. Uh, you write, my point in mentioning these rights, uh, my point in mentioning them reflects the reality that many of our most intractable and vicious political battles emerge when we have conflicting beliefs about the rights to which people are entitled. Yes, discussions over what political rights should be protected and what economic rights should be extended are critical, but these issues are already being intensely studied and debated. Instead, the aim here was to focus on another often overlooked dimension of citizenship. I, Richard Haas, am speaking here of obligations of what citizens owe one another and the country. I think that's really, really important. It's also important that you didn't say I, Richard Haas, I added that. But that's so important. Why? <laughs> Should have had you do the audible edition. Would have sold much better, I'm, I'm, I'm sure. Look, look, rights are, are again, obviously essential. That's what freedom and democracy are based on. But what happens when rights come into conflict? The rights of the mother against uh, the rights uh, of the unborn, the right to bear arms against the right to public safety, the right to not get vaccinated or not wear a mask against the right to public health. How do we mediate that? How do we, how do we manage that situation? And no one seems to be talking about that. And so what we have is a political system now that's essentially gridlocked because of these competing absolute notions of rights. And all or nothing politics, Pete, in my experience, become really dangerous because in the absence of compromise, those who lose are going to, some of them are going to say, we have no recourse, but either to opt out or worse yet, resort to violence. So my view is we need obligations to one another and to the country. So our, our political differences do not deteriorate either into gridlock or worse yet, some version of civil conflict. Yeah. And I want to talk about the obligations. I do. I do. But we got to get to the, the second part of, of the opening of your book, Democratic Deterioration, because, again, you you take a look at history and, and how we got here and what the founders were concerned about. But I mean, where we're at now, you, you know, as, as, as well as anybody in the country where we are at now. And you touch on this, but I just want to give you my quick take and then you can pick up from it. So much of it is, as you say, we don't have a, a collective experience. There's so much diversity, but we used to at least have uh, a collective reality because there were just a few networks and newspapers. We all agreed that uh, that who won the elections, generally speaking, or that people were were still living that were living or that people died. It was only the conspiracy theorists and the fringe fringe, but that has changed so much. I argue because of media, but there's several other reasons as well. How, how do we get here? Say a bit about the deterioration of our democracy in the time that you've been in your ivory tower. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I had to take a shot. At you. <laughs> well, one, you're right. Media is part of it. We've gone from broadcasting to narrow casting and people choose their favorite cable or AM or serious radio uh, station. Worse yet, they choose social media, which is more social than media in, in many cases. So that's part of it. I think the fact that we don't teach our history, our story, and our schools is a big part of it. Why should we assume that Americans are born with an understanding of, an appreciation of, a feel for the value of this democracy and what it takes to operate it well? I think that's part of it. I think we have much less mobility in this country. There's an article in the New York Times this week which used phrases I've never heard, talked about literally rural urban apartheid, the idea that there's such a division in America uh, between the rural America and the uh, urban America. 
and talked about calcification of our social uh, situation where people really get locked in and again, much less change or uh, mobility. I also think that a lot of people are truly unhappy with their circumstances. The polls show it. It explains the, the populism, whether the degree of economic inequality, the, la- the stagnation in wages, the mistakes, quite honestly, that the establishment has made, whether it was Iraq or the 2007-8 financial crisis. So for any number of reasons, we don't know our history. We don't see the value of democracy. To the contrary, we look at what's going on in Washington and people say, why keep that? Why right. keep the kind of circus we saw what the Republicans did the other day in the, in the House? So, yeah, we need to improve what goes on in Washington. But I also think we need to give people a little bit larger and longer perspective. How much do you think accountability is at issue talking about the, the, the Iraq war? Nobody got in trouble for that, really. Nobody big. Nobody, none of the architects, the, the meltdown of the economy, none of the architects of that. You talked about that. And of course, I would argue I'd throw in maybe, you know, January 6th and, and whether or not the top people will be held accountable for that. How much is accountability a play? You see other countries, South Korea, Iceland, and, and other countries, they, they hold powerful people, their leaders accountable. I mean, it can be done. We've done it in different sectors, sure. right? I'm more interested in political accountability than legal accountability. I feel there's a legal system to deal with violations of the law. I've written a book about obligations, which are not matters of law, but matters of things that you should do or should not do. And that's where political accountability is. I feel leaders ought to be held accountable for their performance for what they do and and how they do it. And they ought to either be rewarded or penalized uh, in the ballot box or the court of public opinion or what have you. And I think there hasn't been enough of that, in part because Americans are not politically informed enough. They're not politically active enough. Why is it we just had a midterm election at a critical juncture in American history and more than half of the eligible voters didn't vote? Do you have any idea why? Yeah, people have all sorts of reasons. It's hard to vote. They didn't get time off from work. They don't think their vote makes a difference. A plague on all your houses. Yeah. They, it wouldn't make a difference. You know, if millions of people vote, why does one vote matter? So people have any number of reasons to explain why it is they don't vote. But the fact is, if, if people don't vote, then it gives a disproportionate influence for those who do bother to vote. And by the way, those who do bother to vote in many cases, have stronger views, which is one of the reasons we're seeing the end zones in American political life often dominate what happens at midfield. Well said. On um, pages 33, 34, 35, I say it because people listening are going to want to, like, you basically list so many of the solutions that have been offered by a lot of the smart people that you read and talk to, that I read and talk to, um, that people call into my show over the years and suggest, that my dad has suggested these ideas to make things better. There, I, I, can't, I can't read them all, but there's all kinds of really interesting ideas that have been proposed for elections to make a more equitable uh, economy and more robust democracy. And I think that's really important and we could go through those, but the pro- I feel like the problem, and then I'll get to the obligations here that you list out, which I think are all important and touch on this is that we don't have an agreement on what reality is, Richard. I just, I call it earth one and earth two. If we can't agree that there is a horrible virus that's killing millions of people uh, or that certain people are alive and certain people are dead. You mentioned the NFL, you know, there's a conspiracy that that, that crap that, that, that DeMar Hamlin is dead uh, or that we can't agree on who won the election. This is where we are at this crossroads of where we can't agree. How do we get to these practical policy ideas and solutions at any level of government if we can't even agree what time it is today? Well, the answer is we won't. One of the things I'm encouraged by, Pete, is there's a movement in the United States called information literacy. New Jersey is the first state to pass a law, it just happened the other week, to require the teaching of information literacy in elementary and high schools. And the idea is to teach uh, students, what is a fact? What's an opinion? Mm -hmm. How do you multi-source where you get your information from? How do you reach uh, a better appreciation of what to pay attention to, what not to? where to go for these things. I think that's great. I would love to see this on a national uh, level. It doesn't teach you what to think. It it teaches you though, how to navigate the fact that we're overwhelmed by not just information, 
but misinformation, conspiracy theories and, and the like. And that's something I'd like to see replicated at a national level. Yeah, I'd love to talk to somebody who's involved with that maybe and, and, and see what they're thinking and, and follow it and see if it's successful. All right. Part two of your book, The Bill of Obligations. Richard Haas, I'm going to read them. I don't care what anybody says. I think this will be a, a, an interesting way to get through, you know, because we're not going to get to maybe details on all of them. Obligation one, be informed. Two, get involved. Three, stay open to compromise. Four, remain civil. Hard to do. Five, reject violence. Easier. Six, value norms. Seven, promote the common good. Eight, respect government service. Nine, support the teaching of civics. And 10, put country first. I think you just touched on one, be informed and in, in how we can do that in information literacy. Uh, and you wrote a piece for The Atlantic, which is kind of excerpted from the book about teaching civics. So maybe we could just go to number nine. I don't know if you put them in any particular order of importance, but what is civics? Civics is teaching uh, Americans everything from basic history to the structure of government, the operations of government. And then some of the things I write about in this book, what are the behaviors, the attitudes that are required for American democracy to to succeed and why, by the way, it's probably a good thing that American democracy succeeds. The problem now is while civics are offered on every college campus one way or another, courses in American government, and a tiny minority only are they required. So you can graduate from just about anywhere and if you juggle your distribution requirements uh, the way you want to, you can leave campus without any understanding of American democracy or your role in it as a citizen. Many high schools teach maybe half a year in it, some teach none. Uh, but again, it's wildly uneven. There's been a kind of crowding out effect where we're much more concerned with STEM and other subjects. And this is seen as somehow an elective in many uh, places. So one of the things I'd love to see is a serious civics education or requirement to graduate high school and college alike. The only challenge I see, I mean, there's a lot of challenges, obviously, but it's like, man, we have always had, I think, thoughtful criticisms of curriculum at every level of public education. But now, like, again, going back to things that aren't happening, I've been very involved in my local community. It's been so ugly here, Richard. People like my neighbors are arguing with them about what's not or is happening in our school. You know, my neighbors are screaming about CRT and every teacher and every administrator is like, what are you talking about? We don't have that. So, you know, how do we get civics if we can't agree that certain things aren't even being taught or, you know, people are talking about litter boxes and shit. It's crazy. Ain't going to be easy, but I am pretty well convinced that out of all the things I write about, this might be on the short list about the most important and potentially the most doable. So after uh, I leave this job, uh, I will devote a chunk of my life to trying to make this happen, to putting together a curriculum that I believe stands a chance of, of being uh, adopted around this country. I think it's crazy, not to use too fine of a word, the idea that a student in Arkansas and a student, say, in uh, Oregon would, if they were to study civics at all at the high school level, would study different civics. If the whole idea is to knit together a national fabric, why would we have different state approaches to civics at the national level? I could see you would at state or local government, but it seems to me it makes zero sense that we don't have a common civics curriculum. Well, I'm happy to hear that. And it leads perfectly to obligation number two, which is get involved. So you're leaving uh, uh, CFR and you're going to do just as you said yourself. Now you've got a huge network and, and, and the type of involvement that you'll be doing would be different than I, I would imagine your suggestion to the average reader. Uh, wh what is the average reader? What do you, what do you mean? What, what should we, what should we be doing? I mean, I pick up litter when I go on my walks. That's good. And my daughter will thank you since she works for the department of sanitation here in the city of New York. Oh. But I think that you know, there's other things citizens can do. I mean, you mentioned uh, parents, it's what parent, and Ronald Reagan said, the most important room in the house is around the dinner table. Mm. What parents do, what talk to their kids about. And, and, and these issues, parents can talk about civility and compromise and not, uh, not resorting to uh, violence. Parents can demonstrate civics by voting. Take, in, take your kids with you when you uh, vote. Parents can get involved, not you know, in school board issues. You've talked about CRT. But parents can also get involved in calling for for uh, civics. Uh, businesses can get involved. Why not make it easier for employees to vote? 
Why don't businesses uh, stop advertising on places that are supporting election deniers or people calling for political violence? So there's lots of things. Religious leaders. I'm not saying anyone speaking from the pulpit should advocate policy views. Why can't religious leaders talk about civility and not resorting to violence? I would think that's a pretty, so that's an idea that's pretty consistent with uh, the basics of Judeo-Christian ethics. So I think there's uh, a lot of things that ordinary citizens uh, can and should do. I'll make it even easier. I'll make one suggestion. Uh, in your town, uh, subscribe to the town newsletter and subscribe to the newsletter that comes from the school district, even if you don't have kids, about the Board of Education and read that email when it comes in. We are so focused on national politics and controversies happening outside of our communities and weighing in on them. And we have no idea. And by the way, I just think this is so irresponsible. And I'm very judgmental of people who, you know, in my community and elsewhere who aren't paying attention to local because that's what's affecting your kids the most. That's what's affecting your property the most. When you're not worried about the water in your town, you know, you're worried about somebody else's water. Meanwhile, they're fracking in your town or whatever it is. So subscribe to those those emails is what I would add. All right. Let me you're get right. to Look, you're channeling your inner Chip O'Neill. All politics is local. And there's also a place, local politics, it's less difficult to have an impact if you're quote unquote an ordinary citizen. It's easier to show up at the town hall, at the school board, what have you. Smaller numbers of people voting, so individual votes matter a lot more. Much more difficult to have an impact at the national level. I uh, resent that you said I was channeling my inner Tip O'Neill. I would have gone with a, like a more of an activist type of person, but okay. I apologize. Uh, uh, but uh, you say value norms as obligation number six. That makes you and me, because I agree with you, sound old. What do you mean value norms? Why is that first, important? First of all, I am old. Uh, but norms are traditions. Again, these are obligations. These are not things you have to do. I mean, the one I write a little bit about is what you know, the president's refusal to accept a legitimate electoral outcome, not to go up right up Pe Pennsylvania Avenue with uh, his successor who defeated him in a free and fair election. That's outrageous. That is That to me was... More than anything else, the distinguishing feature of American democracy is the peaceful and automatic transfer of power. That's what distinguishes our democracy. That's why we're the envy, or were the envy, of the world. And the, the fact that President Trump ignored or violated that norm without any evidence justifying his position, to me, is exactly the sort of uh, deterioration that we don't want to see in our, in our politics. Or now with the Representative Santos. The idea that uh, he is being seated and treated as a legitimate uh, representative. Again, that violates everything we believe in. So he may not, I don't know whether he broke the law, Pete. We'll find out. My guess is he may have. But even short of breaking the law, the idea that you can lie your way into Congress and then be treated as a legitimate representative, no way. Uh, the Speaker of the House, Mr. McCarthy, should not treat him as a legitimate member of the House. Yeah, well... Good luck with that. Um, but his time is limited by the time. Well, I'm posting this interview right away, but uh, he's like that head of lettuce. I feel like he's uh, I don't know. I mean, right. Like he's got it. He'll there's no way he's going to last. I don't think it's it's hard to imagine because where there's smoke, there's fire. And there's already uh, this is a pretty smoky room there. Uh, I'll ask you one more and I'll let you go. And everybody's going to have to read the rest of them. But you talk about rejecting violence. And I was just watching that. I don't know if you've seen the um, LBJ movie uh, on, on HBO. The Brian Cranston plays LBJ on this movie on HBO. And it's really interesting just watching Dr. King and him negotiate and, uh, you know, re rejecting violence. They got to a point in the civil rights movement. Well, there was always a, a debate about that. Obviously, uh, you still think that works, but obviously, and I do too. But increasingly, we are seeing a kind of violence um, all over the country, especially targeted towards marginalized communities, that is scary as hell. Well, how, what do you mean when, when you're talking about it? What can we do better? Look, I worry about political violence from any direction because it will feed on itself. I spent several years as the U.S. envoy to Northern Ireland. Then I went back as the international mediator. Northern Ireland went through three decades of the so-called troubles. And political violence was the norm. And I saw what it did to a society and an economy. It could happen here. Imagine what happened on January 6th began to happen every now and then at this or that state house, this or that town hall, this or that economic uh, facility. So it, it, it could happen here. And, you know, we're obviously armed to the teeth in this uh, society. So 
I worry about this. And it gets back to where we began the conversation. If people believe that rights are absolute, there's no, that compromise is, is inherently wrong, then potentially we end up in violent uh, confrontations. So I don't think we ought to uh, dismiss it. I think what we need to do is delegitimize it. That's where, again, I think religious figures could play a role. Parents could play a role. That gets into the larger questions about you know gun laws, restrictions on certain kinds of weapons, restrictions on who has access to uh, uh, weapons. There's got to be some compromise uh, there. But that's I just it's not a conversation I ever thought I'd have. But I can't dismiss the idea that political violence will become more commonplace in this country. We're not talking about a, a second civil war, but we are talking about a kind of grinding down of, of public life where it becomes more dangerous. I appreciate you joining me. You know, a story I, I often tell, I just want you to confirm that it happened. Uh, I think about this a lot. Is I, I, want, I once hung out with you, former Manhattan uh, uh, DA, prosecutor, Cy Vance, John Meacham with a cigar. Our wives were there. We all hung out at some rich dude's house at Aspen. It was one of the, the great, the, I had a great time, despite, you know, what I denounce affluence and, and rich people and, and the likes of you. Uh, it was really wonderful, and I learned a lot. And you can confirm that 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 happened. Those people were all together, us, weren't it's we? It's all it's it's all true. And actually, you look pretty comfortable with affluence, so as I as I recall it. <laughs> I, really, <laughs> I did look comfortable with affluence. Ah, you bastard! You nailed me right there at the end. Very hard, hard to come back. I got nothing. I got nothing. Go buy the book, The Bill of Obligations. I guess just I would like you to denounce all former and future interviews because no one will have done a better, deeper dive on this book. Uh, go ahead. Thank you, Pete. It's uh, it's been been too long, and it's good to be back with you.